Hey, Club Scouts. Before we jump back into the podcast this week, Bryce, Riley, and I just wanted to state for the record that Bigfoot Collectors Club stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. If you want to join the conversation or take action, we've included some helpful links to organizations we support in the show notes. Stay safe and stay strong. Enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. It's Michael with Bryce and Riley. Say hi, guys. What's up? Hi, Uh, guys. We got a great episode for you today. But before we do the episode, we've got some Patreon shout outs. This is everybody who has joined Bigfoot Collectors Club, the other side over at patreon.com slash Bigfoot Collectors Club this past month. Um, You guys are awesome. the right move. Here we go. I want to say thank you to all of you guys. Uh, Mark Erlinson. Thank you. Paranormal Punchers. Thank you. Dustin. Thank you, Dustin. Will Bailey with a generous donation. Thank you. AJ Oslin upgraded their pledge. Ooh, thanks, AJ. Samuel Bennett. Thank you. Isaac. Thank you. Leslie Petty. Thank you, Leslie. John Snyder. Thanks, John. Rachel Bussert, our librarian friend, upgraded hey. their pledge. Oh, nice. Thanks, Rach. Katie. Thank you. Jacob Miller. Thank you. Megan Gores. Thank you. William Rutledge. Thanks, William. Sounds like somebody who'd be uh, hunting the Snallygaster. Yeah, it does. John C. Kudas. Thank you, John. Randy Witt. Thank you. Cameron Gonzalez. Thank you. Liz Schneider. Thank you, Liz. Janelle Jillian. Thank you. Claudia Reitz. Thank you. Carla Monterey. Thanks, Carla. Hannah ha- Anna Hansen. Ooh, thank you. Stephen Wagner. Thanks, Stephen. Sarah Jean. Thank you. Adela Levine. Yay! Uh, thanks, Adela. We love you. Uh, also, a uh, guest this month on the show, Amy Marie. Thank you, Amy. Shasta McDermott. Thanks. Chris Caldwell. Thank you, Chris. Janessa Eddy, a generous pledge. Thank you. Barbara Perry. Thank you. Julie Kumasaka. Thank you, Julie. Heidi Klein. Thank you. Nikki Rotunda. Thank you. Summer Breeze. Thank you, Summer. Bonnie Craig. Thank you. And Matthew Dickey. Oh, my gosh. Thanks, Thank Matthew. you to all of you who have wow. joined us. Uh, the other side really is the other half of Bigfoot Collectors Club. This May, we dropped four new bonus episodes, one with Mystic Dylan, one with Adela, as I mentioned, uh, both of whom are today's guests. Our new monthly mini foot, where we talk about all things BCC and an entire episode devoted to the Snallygaster. If you'd like to support the show, please head over to patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock three to five reward episodes every month for a monthly pledge of five dollars oh my gosh you guys are the best thank you so much guess what now it's time for the show oh Oh. 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 god It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness. I'm your host, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host, Bryce Johnson. And our super producer, Riley Bray. Hello boys. Hey Hi guys. Hey guys. So look, shit's crazy right now. We all know it. Uh, we hope you're staying safe and strong. We're supporting you out there. Uh, but right now we're going to take a break from everything and just slip into the other world of the unknown, uh, with a big bag of L files, your listener stories. Uh, so let's just escape. Let's all cuddle around the campfire and let's come together and let's just tell some spooky stories. How's that sound? I think that sounds great. You know, I love that. It seems Bigfoot Collectors Club is really we're collecting these stories now. It seems, and and there's there's a huge co- a database that we're collecting from our great listeners. So I always love doing listener files. 
And we have if some you, great guests on today's episode, too. We do. We'll get to them in just a moment. But I want to tell our listeners, if you have a story you want to share with us, please email us at BigfootCollectorsClub at gmail.com. All right, guys. Uh, today, boy, oh, boy, are you in for a treat. You love them. They're fan favorites. We have, from the Witch in the Medium podcast, Adela Levine and Mystic Dylan. Yay. Hello, you two. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hello. Um, we have, <laughs> get ready for some stories today, guys, and I'm glad that we have the experts here to unpack a few of these. Um, how are you guys? How are you doing? I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> we're <laughs> we're, 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 we're hanging amazing. in. I think, I think for us, we Dylan may agree. We are on double time with the work we do. So it's been that and i know for myself i can't speak for him but um kind of trying to find a way to bring have downtime is it is actually been more of a work yes to remember a hundred percent i i feel i feel like it's 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 i i don't know what downtime is at the moment like <laughs> <laughs> i have to ask for another extension on my book i was supposed to be done yesterday and and the world just got away from me. So and I kept texting him. So that helped. But yeah. So I, I, I do. I am sending a Venmo request to Adela uh, for a thousand dollars because she actually has been distracting me from writing instead of the initial um, trying to get me to write. So essentially, what you're saying is you're procrastinating right now, being with us, Dylan. Yes, uh, Michael, Bryce, and Riley, you two will, all three of you will also get that no request. Yes. <laughs> I, I take full uh, responsibility. Fantastic. Before we get to our stories, do you guys want to, starting with Adela, just reintroduce yourself for new listeners, what you do, and, uh, and you know, why you're here? Hi. Yeah. So um, I'm a Dale Levine, as you said. I don't know why I said that, but I'm an intuitive and a medium. Um, intuitive uh, part of me and what I do is I do readings um, and um, teaching and all that kind of jazz for about a long time, over 10 years. And intuitive part of me is seeing the future and looking at, you know, timelines and people's lives and, um, and such. And medium side of me is talking to people who died, talking to the dead. Does that sum it up? That sounds awesome. good to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And then I'm a co-host with my friend and co-host of the witch in the medium with mystic Dylan. Woo. Go ahead, Dylan. Uh, I'm mystic Dylan. I do witchcraft uh, <laughs> and, um, I teach classes and, uh, do readings and I've studied, uh, in New Orleans and, um, New York and, uh, I am a soon to be author and I'm the co-host of the podcast, which in the medium with Adela, the medium, Adela, awesome. Levine, the medium. <laughs> I think, uh, Dylan, you, slow down on that soon to be author, right? Yeah. So, Right. One day, one day, <laughs> three years from now. <laughs> All right, guys. Yep. Well, we have we have some awesome stories. I want to get to them, and uh, before we do that, I want to open Bigfoot's big old mailbag because we actually have some physical mail here to address. What? what? Yeah. What? Um, cool. So I got a couple shout outs. Uh, one, this is. So overdue. This is like late last year overdue. My apologies to Eric and Joe who sent us their Cryptic Creatures board game uh, that's in our clubhouse right now that we have not been able to play yet. Um, thank you for sending that over to us. It looks awesome. I'll post a picture of it and put it on this episode's Instagram. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sending that to us. And that will be the subject of a future uh, Patreon release for sure. No uh, doubt but then also, it. I finally got a shipment. It's been, um, I meant to do this in the last L Files episode and forgot. Ronnie, listener Ronnie, sent us a package and I haven't opened it yet. It's in a manila envelope that says bullshit or believe it. And then he circled, <laughs> believe it. So I'm going to open up and see what's in uh -oh. here, Ronnie. Oh, oh my God. boy. Ro oh, Ronnie, I know it took you a yeah, couple tries to get this to us. So it is a book. 
and it is called <sighs> The Messengers, Owl's Synchronicity and the UFO Abductee by Mike Cleland, oh, forward no by Richard M. Dolan. This is a cool looking book, dude. That's I've awesome. heard of that book. Well, we've got it in our Ooh. library now. Oh. Um, it says, uh, Nick Redfern has a quote on the back. I get the strong sense that Mike Cleland was guided to write this by the UFO intelligences. I believe the phenomenon in t- uh, believe the phenomenon intended it to be written. So this is all about the connection between owls and aliens. This is pretty oh, fucking cool. Wow. Thank cool. you. Ow, cool. I love was owls. Was that a That's movie, so though? Awesome. That wasn't a movie. The Messengers sounds familiar. I don't think I... this specifically is a movie, but there okay. might be a movie called The Messengers. Mm, the Messengers. All right. Well, thank you for sending that. Uh, if you want to write into us snail mail, you can send stuff to us at Bigfoot Collectors Club, P.O. Box 1107, Hollywood, California, 90078. Um, there you go, guys. Okay, let's get into today's listener files. We're going to start with a, uh, a follow up to our last L Files episode with Jen Kirkman. And if uh, if you didn't listen to that, uh, Adela and Mystic Dylan, don't worry, we're going to bring you up to speed. I did. Okay, great. So um, uh, they wrote a follow up. This is, uh, <clears throat> hey guys, it's Ashley from Maryland with the floating fence. L-M-A-O. Uh, remember, this is a story about the woman who saw that creepy zombie-like entity by that old mm. silo. She said, thanks so much for reading my story. I was so excited. I was shaking. Sorry for scaring the shit out of Jen, laughing my <laughs> ass off. Uh, no, the fence wasn't floating. It was an optical illusion because we were moving. And I mm. did keep it short, but there were other reactions in the car which are worth noting in hindsight. No, my friend Karen got... Uh, Oh, oh, my! Oh, sorry. My friend Karen got so nauseous she slept half the way home. My friend Dylan's legs were shaking. I felt both of these things and didn't say a word. Also, Alex, the empath, said he felt my energy spike when I saw the rotting man. And yes, I slept with my pentacle on and my black candles burning. I was scared out of my wits. Thanks again so much. I love you guys and the pod. XO Ashley. Um. So that's a thank you for the follow up. What, uh, Dylan, what do pentacles and black candles do? Do they help protect you from scary zombie yeah. corpses? Well, I mean, I don't know about <laughs> scary zombie corpses, but actually, yeah, in, in folklore, the whole idea, uh, um, a huge miss, uh, information is that like black candles are not, they can be used to hex, but initially black is, is, it's the combination of all colors. So it's actually used, uh, for protection. Uh, and it's used to kind of uh, detract negativity. And um, in uh, colonial times during the 17th century, uh, you would uh, burn a uh, candle out of your home. Uh, and that was supposed to kind of get rid of spirits. Uh, and the pentacle also not a satanic symbol, uh, but used for protection. So, I mean, that's probably what I would do. I probably would throw some salt there as well. Um, but she definitely took the right stance in in that magical aspect of protecting herself. We just learned on uh, last week's Patreon episode over on the other side about the Snallygaster that Dutch farmers used to paint seven pointed stars on their barns to protect them from evil spirits. It was all part of a Dutch, a Dutch hex tradition that had been passed. Yeah. Down. I thought it was six pointed star. Didn't we? Well, no, the seven oh, no, pointed yeah, star. We, we talked about it. We talked six about six pointed stars, yeah, yeah, six yeah, pointed yeah, stars yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah but it, the, 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 right. it would You're protect right. them, their barn from demons and evil spirits that would try to come after their livestock. Absolutely. And, the, and that goes back to, um, that's also called the seven pointed star is sometimes called the fairy pentacle, uh, because they use it in, uh, like fairy traditions of like Irish, Gaelic, Dutch, all that. Hmm. So that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. That. Um, okay. Well, this story is not done because we have a letter from Alex, the empath himself, about this very incident. Bryce, will you read us that letter, please? Yes, uh, absolutely. So he calls this my scariest story so far, a different perspective. Hello, I was referred to your podcast by my dear friend Ashley, or Ashley from Maryland, who sent you her story about seeing a decomposing man at a park. 
of which I listen to you guys read aloud on 429. My name is Alex, and I am the empath referred to in the story and would love to tell you the story from my point of view. First off, I'd like to say that all of what Ashley said is 100% true. I live in a rural town in Maryland known as Brian's Road. For the sake of protection, I will use aliases of the other two people who were with Ashley and myself that night in 2015. The night started off simplistic. Ashley, Mark, and Kathy came to visit me from Hagerstown, Maryland. I once had a friend, let's call him Kenneth, who once claimed to be able to feel paranormal energies. I took him to the park of which was mentioned in Ashley's story, and I remember he went up to the entrance of Ashley's aforementioned fence. He put his hands on the post, lowered his head, and within minutes came back to my car and told me in a cold yet frightening voice that, quote, we needed to go. This all took place in 2012. Fast forward to 2015 and meeting Ashley and company for the first time. Ashley was explaining to me about the concept of being a seer. Me, being the most open-minded person one can meet, took interest in Ashley and listened to what she had to tell me. I remember the night that I took Kenneth to the park and was wondering what Ashley's perspective was. Kenneth and I had a falling out and found out that he lied about a lot of stuff. Ashley agreed to go to the park with Mark and Kathy. Ashley is very talkative, bubbly and outgoing, though I noticed the closer I got to the park, the more silent she fell. This began to worry me. We arrived at the park and we were only there logically for five minutes, but it felt like forever. I looked around and saw that Mark was zoned out, and a very wide awake and energetic Kathy had fallen asleep instantly. Ashley began whimpering and immediately exclaimed that, quote, we need to go. I don't hesitate. I didn't hesitate and I sped away from the scene as fast as I could. Ashley wondered why I didn't feel anything, but in reality, I always felt something when I was there. I felt uneven even during the day that I would frequent there. One thing that I always wear is a cross with Jesus on it. This cross contains the name of my brother who died back in 2002. I also had my grandmother who was a member of the Order of the Eastern Star kiss and blew it shortly before she died. I bless believe it that, short, bless it shortly. <laughs> and and blessed it shortly before uh, she died. I believe that this <laughs> important note. Just let's get that word right. That was a good question. <laughs> So, Michael, <laughs> I, I believe that this cross warded me against the rotting man that Ashley saw that night. She described to me in detail what she saw, and I remember holding her trying to console her. The difference between her and me is that she got to go home two hours away. I still live right down the street from what she saw. Alex. Whoa. There you go. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. What's, your, what is your in, what's your instinct tell you uh, about this, Adela? Um, she, it is pretty actually not crazy that she felt sleepy. This happens a lot. People I've had people experience this before. It's because you get overwrought by the, the frequency that those entities, which are spirits, but maybe spirits that are not like, Hey, what's up? How are you doing type of spirits? So, um, it can feel very heavy and it can feel, it can, um, suck, you know, your energy. If you don't know how to protect, if you don't know how to not let it in, this happens a lot to people. Hmm. Why would someone see a ghost of a rotting corpse? I kind of remember that part that it was like a zombie, right? That they were trying to describe it as like a zombie looking person. Yeah. Ro- like a walking rotting man. So Pete, into that's why I'm trying to say this isn't like, you know, Joe saying, Hey, how's it going? I'm just Joe that died. If there are in there, what people don't realize is there are entities that kind of enjoy pushing people away and appearing in a way that would be not pleasant. So, um, I know there's many names for it. People can say like demon or this or that, but they're, I just call them like, you know, my gut feeling, honestly, is that whatever that land they were at is they were not wanting them there at that so, particular So this spot. is the spiritual equivalent of the old man shouting at kids to get off his lawn. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's like the old man to get off his lawn, but a lot more than that. It's like the old man with a gun saying, get off his lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Is that wow. okay to say? I mean, yeah. it's more aggressive. It's you know, like an old man who's just grumpy is what I would say uh, most spirits are. But when there's an aggressive spirit 
which sometimes when I've done cleansings on lands that I didn't even know were uh, people died, Native Americans, as people always kind of get that, like there's something about Native American land. It's not, when I've talked to them, they're not trying to hurt people. They just see it as you need to respect that someone died there and then they're good to go if you being there. But hmm. if you're goofing around on that kind of thing, they're like, this isn't, this isn't you kind of really having a oneness with the space. So I just get the feeling something didn't like whatever, if they were casually hanging out there and they'll be aggressive like that. And I call it unmasking. You can unmask them and you can see they may not be as scary as you thought. That's interesting. Cool. You know, Alex, my my grandmother was a member of the Order of the Eastern Star. And for those who aren't familiar, what is that? It's Mind re- you, it, it's 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 the sister version it. of the of the Freemasons. Uh, so it's yeah. really you know how we consider a funny feeling podcast sort of the the sister version of our show. That's the it's the same way. It was for female members to join the uh, you know fraternal mm-hmm. society of the Freemasons, and it had the pentagram and everything too. And it was it was really kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, there's a lady at where I used to read at Mystic Journey. Her husband is a master mason, and I went oh, to yeah. the temple, and they took gave me a tour, and I sat in the in the throne and everything. And she was a part of that, and she took me through the whole thing. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, love that stuff. Yeah, my aunt used to go used to go to those meetings. Um, and actually, there's an old. I mean, it's definitely a myth and a legend, uh, but there was a. There was a myth that a lot of the uh, our forefathers, like they were obviously, well, the majority of them were known to be uh, Freemasons, but the Eastern Star were like apparently an old coven of like witches. Mm. So there was always this, and and there, if you look at if you look at Freemasonry, there's a lot of links to uh, ceremonial magic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hundred percent. That's what the guy told me. He said that's what they kind of base it on. So. Yeah, that that's super cool. I didn't know that. I love it. Um, okay, awesome. Uh, I have two letters here. One is very, very quick, uh, but I just wanted to make sure we address. This is from uh, a listener. She says, hello, I'm a big fan of the show, and I love when Jen Kirkman is on. I've also been a fan of Michael since What I Like About You. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, moving nice. on <laughs> to the next letter. No. Uh, <laughs> That is amazing. She said, uh, so I've had countless paranormal experiences throughout my life to the point where I thought this was normal. So I have many more stories and I may ask your opinion on in the future since they have stuck with me years later. But I wanted to get your opinion on this photo. I currently live in Texas, but I am from Kansas. My sister still lives in Lawrence, Kansas. Shout out, Lawrence. I love you. And uh, we were visiting and staying at her house in October 2018. It was Halloween day and I was sitting in her backyard just enjoying the spookiness in the air and taking pictures of my dogs. And I immediately saw something orb-like in the photo. But this was unlike any orb I've ever seen. It looked like an emerald and it was so clear. What is your opinion? Thanks, guys. Um, So the rest of the gang doesn't have this pulled up in front of them. I took a look at the photo and there is a bright little green emerald shiny dot in the photo. And I've learned this, speaking of our sister podcast, uh, Funny Feeling, Marcy was talking about this phenomenon lately that apparently with one of the later uh, iPhones, this green dot shows up a lot because of the lens. So I think this photo is actually part mm. of the lens in your camera. Not saying you haven't experienced other orbs. But this might be why it looks different from other orbs you've seen. So this is a recurring thing with one of the latest um, uh, phones. Uh, mm. So just just putting that out there for people. I think wah, that's a camera wah, lens thing. Wah, 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 wah. Um, oh my god! I was gonna we'll, do that. We'll put this. We'll put this photo. We'll <laughs> put this photo well. up in this episode so <laughs> listeners can take a look at it as well and see if it's if it. Uh, if it rings a bell. What were you saying, Adela? No, I just had it in my head what Bryce just did, so it was really weird. But I was like, <laughs> I'm not good at that. So I'm not I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> All right. So uh thank you, listener from Lawrence and uh well Texas via Lawrence, but uh, uh yeah, I think it's uh I think it's I think it's just an anomaly. Okay, here we go. This is called mm. Phantom Phone Call. Hey guys. Mm. A little backstory to set this up. My wife was very close with her maternal grandparents. Being an only child and the only grandchild in the same town, it's needless to say she was spoiled by them. 
When her grandmother passed in the summer of 2000, my wife spent a lot of time with her grandfather. They formed a great bond. He always called and drove by. And in March of 2003, her mother passed away after complications from medical issues. My wife's bond with her grandfather grew more, with the loss of her mom being a connection between them. Her grandfather accepted me as one of his own, and I couldn't be more than grateful for that. We got married in 2008, and he was proud, uh, and he was proud that day. Grandpa eventually moved into a retirement home in a different city, but that didn't stop the phone calls. But it was just us driving to visit, bringing our son, his great-grandson. And we kept our landline because that's the number uh, Grandpa knew, even though we only used our cell phones. Their bond was strong. We made sure to spend every Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter with her family. Her grandpa passed away in February of 2015 at age 93. Before we had a chance to tell him we were going to have another baby, he was the type of guy no one had a bad word to say about him. A devastating day for my wife and us all, but a day we knew that would a day we knew would come. A couple months later, we got rid of the landline and no one called it anymore. On a Saturday that next November, my wife was sitting on the couch and I was not too far away. Her cell phone rings with a number from our town, but not one we knew. She answers, hello, there's nothing. She says, hello, again, and she hears, clear as day, her grandfather's voice say, do you miss me? Freaked out and shaken, she asks, who is this? And then there is nothing, and she hangs up. I see the look on my wife's face, and she's in tears, and I ask her what's wrong. She tells me it was her grandfather asking her if she missed him. Even when he was alive, he never called her cell phone. I Google searched the number and it came back as a, uh, says here, a Denise. Her, oh, her grandfather's name was Dennis. Well, that's okay. That's weird for other reasons. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Um, I love it. We never called the number back just to let that moment live on on its own. I contacted a medium that I knew and trust, and she says it happens more than we know. My wife says, I didn't hear it when it happened, but I can hear it in my head. But maybe that's the memory of his voice within me. It has never happened again, but the touch lamp in our living room that was her grandparents will turn on sometimes, the last time on the anniversary of the day that her mother passed away. I want to thank you guys for great work you do on the show. I found you through Hel- the Hellier rabbit hole. And like you, I'm a lover of all things weird and strange, and you've been uh, you've given my mind a great escape from the chaos of the world. I'm 41 years old, a huge Star Wars nerd. I have my last name uh, have my last name tattooed in Arabesh on my arm. That's rad. And I still have <laughs> figures in the box. Got it. I build Legos with my son and daughter and share them uh, with all them, the cool cartoons we had when we were kids in the 80s and 90s. And on top, to top it off, I still collect baseball cards. The show was built for me. You guys are fucking heroes. Keep up the great work. Cheers and be weird, John. Uh, thanks, John. Wow. Oh, that nice. gave me yeah. fucking chills. Awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, that is, it's very true that, I mean, I guess you didn't ask me, so I'm just jumping in, but I have to say that that's very, very common. I can't even tell you how many strange things I've had with phones, not just with myself, but I've had, uh, had a client whose wife passed and his phone kept dialing me and being logical. I thought, it was um, it was right when I first started reading from him. I thought it was in his pocket because he's older, but he said he was watching it dial on its own. It was on the table. And that kept happening a lot of times and uh, so many other things. So it's a very quick way. Um, technology is one of the favorite ways, by the way, from that realm. It just freaks people out more. Um, and also like electrical things like lamps. I, I, I can't even... I can't even tell probably thousands by now how many people I've seen those things and say it in a reading. And then they're like, yeah, it keeps happening in whatever room or and whatever they're doing. And um, the phone call, it's a little unusual. I will tell that she, it was, it, it was his wife that heard it, right? His Not wife's. Him. Yeah. Because right. it was his wife's grandfather. Okay. So it's, um, it's actually unusual to hear someone say something that is a, a, le- a less common. I feel um, the phone ringing and um, th- and a name come up close to that name. 
that type of thing happens quite a bit. Um, and no one there and that ha- and a phone number that's off that happens a lot. Or like I said, I've had people tell me weird things like, you know, somehow I'm getting called and then they book a radio. I guess I, I guess I should talk to you. That realm is very, they love doing that. So my, my statement to everybody is if you're open to it, um, and you want that stuff to happen, you kind of have to let them know, um, because they know it freaks people out. They want to do it. It's very easy because they're just energy. So it's easy to manipulate frequency, their frequency. You're manipulating a frequency. Whoa. Can we yeah. get a Bigfoot Collectors Club landline hotline for ghosts to call in, Michael? I think that was <laughs> such a good should. idea. That would be and awesome. Michael's in charge of you it. Should. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to need like a really spooky old phone, though, you know? Yeah, like I of imagine course. like a red one, like with the old, yeah, like an old red yeah, with, the turn, with the turn dial. With the turn dial. Totally. Yeah, we should, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I, I think like we should get an antique wall phone with like yeah, the, that has about. the old like speaker speaker cup that you hold up to yeah. your ear yeah i do want to add though uh, i want to add uh and this is i actually learned this fact um uh, fairly recently um but uh she mentions that the the touch lamp uh turned on on the anniversary of uh the grandfather's death or the his, grandmother's her mother's, grandmother's her death. mother's the mother's, uh, her mother's. mother her mother's death and um, one thing that I uh, have known for a minute is that um, in up until the 1800s, and, and I know uh, spirits can speak and make contact whenever, uh, but there's a huge correlation to uh, spirits making or uh, tech, technical difficulties happening during the anniversary of someone's death as opposed to someone's birthday, so much so that in Catholicism, they actually have it stated that if you look, uh, a saint's a saint's day is the day that they died. Um, oh. So it, yeah. So I mean, I know that you know. It, I just think it's very interesting that there are a lot of communications that happen. Maybe it's like a, a reminder of like, hey, or if you're thinking well, it's about them, because people happen. are thinking about them. Yeah, because it's right. it's not because people here. And honestly, in my experience, it happens on birthdays, but it ha- it happens on. Because that person is thinking, you're thinking about them. But I'm trying to tell people also, if you want to make it more frequent, you can make, you know, have a communication with that person and keep putting the communication with that person. And then those things later will happen to correlate because it's always about the correlation for them. So they know you're thinking about them at that time and they're trying to correlate with you because it's all telepathic and and the signs are are them. They can also impress their thoughts onto you in your mind to get you to hear them, and then they'll do something later like that as well. It's all good. Yay. That's awesome. That was a great letter, John. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Riley, you've got one. I do. Okay. I reinforce. This is titled Oceanside UFO. Ooh. Hey there. Yeah, a little surf, surf city, man. Hey there. I finally decided I wanted to send in one of my stories. Around April 2016, me and one of my friends were sitting on the deck of the third story of his condo complex, right next to the harbor in Oceanside, having a few beers. The deck looks down towards the beach and is about 300 yards from the water. At about 10 p.m., we see this strange light about half a mile off the coast and 300 feet in the air. It's flying south down the coast with a helicopter chasing close behind it. I can't explain why, but the way this light was moving was so odd. Its flight was so smooth, steady, and silent. Me and my friend looked at each other and thought how odd that was and went on drinking and forgot about it. Probably. About 10 minutes later, though, the light came flying back up the coast with the same helicopter flying about 100 feet behind it. But this time there was another helicopter, another 300 or so feet behind it, flying a little lower, shining a spotlight down on the water. I wish I had a better way of explaining what was so odd about the way the light was flying, but I didn't. My wife and our friends think we are crazy, but we talk about it to this day and know we saw something crazy. Steven. Wow. Like UFO, you think? That reminds me of... um, uh, Greg Sipe's story about uh, remember his story in Hawaii. How, about could, I, how could you forget? <laughs> you mean when he was taken up by Elvis's UFO and Elvis was wearing gold? 
Yeah, that's and, the one. Uh, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I remember the one. that one. That was funny. <laughs> but didn't he uh, say something about helicopters chasing that time too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting, right? So there's so there's a lot of UFO lore and then uh, you know, black helicopters kind of go along with it. And mm-hmm. uh it, what's interesting is like uh so either A, it's it's part of some militaristic uh you know, uh, actual helicopter chasing that UFO, or or perhaps it, it it's something uh, that goes along with the phenomenon itself. You know, uh, I don't really know. I, I know there's a lot of, uh, like for instance, the the the, the Cash Landrum story. Those were definitely military helicopters, a bunch of them. But yeah, it's interesting. You were definitely, I do. You definitely saw a UFO. There's no doubt about it. What what a UFO is? Now that's anybody's guess. <laughs> That's true. Mm. That could have been a drone test too, though, because Oceanside, I think, is near some military bases. I think that's near Camp Pendleton. Mm. Did they hear noise or was it silent? Did they say in that letter that was it like a was a hovering silent? Silent. It was silent. Yeah. Yeah. It says the flight. It it was flying smooth, steady, and silent. Yeah. Because they have those, right? Because I know my boyfriend when he went to um, Area Fifty One, and they got, they had looked up it. You know what's that little alien hotel? The little alien. Up, yeah, the little alien, and he said he looked up, and they they didn't even know the helicopters are above them because they were so silent. So they don't have those, Whoa. right? Yeah. This is yeah, possible. I mean, it's possible we're witnessing some sort of test. <laughs> Riley, Riley, are we boring, we boring you? <laughs> oh, no. I'm, I'm at high altitude, and it's like I'm still getting used to the uh, oxygen. <laughs> but couldn't it be one of those remote control things that people use? What is it called? The That thingy? You fly the thing? A the, drone. Um, there we go. <laughs> That's what I said. Yeah. He's very high tech. <laughs> Guys, we got lockdown brain. Uh, cla- plastic UFO, as far as I'm concerned. We're going right. to take a quick break. We're going to gather ourselves. And when we come back, we're going to have more L files from you, the listeners. Oh, God, that's so funny. <laughs> All right, we're back, and it's time for more L files. Let's reach into the file cabinet. Bryce, what strange story do you have for us? Hey there, BCC Club. First of all, love you guys, and keep up the great content. After hearing y'all recent listener files and the Groundhog Day troubles, I knew it was time to share with y'all my first psychedelic experience. Like everyone says... I apologize in advance for the length of the story and for my poor writing skills. I'm an engineer, not a wordsmith. Anyway, here it goes. This happened to me my freshman year of college. So most of the trip has faded since then, but there still is one portion I remember with 100% certainty, which we will get to later. It all started because one of my friends had quit smoking weed due to an upcoming drug test. During this time, my friend invited me to smoke some K2 with him. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, I guess that doesn't show up on a drug test. <laughs> I'm done with weed. I'm, I'm like, space is, weed yeah, now. isn't K2 a mountain? Uh, anyway, mind you, up to this point oh in my, my life, God. I had only ever drank and smoked weed, so I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I met my buddy at his truck in one of the huge campus parking lots and figured we'd smoke a quick bowl. Instead so it's synthetic. It. Maybe it doesn't show up on Yeah, I think tests. that's what it is. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Good to note that, everybody. <laughs> Instead, he gets out a huge blunt and we start smoking. About halfway through the blunt, I feel more stone than I've ever been and say, I'm good. He pressures me into helping him finish the blunt. Oh, God. <laughs> which I foolishly gave him. Dude, you got to finish the blunt, bro. I mean, I know you're good, but come on, the blunt's not. Uh, while finishing this thing, I begin to hear and feel a piercing hum, vibration, and a pressure in my forehead starts to build. These feelings build to a crescendo, and just when I think my head is going to pop, I'm blasted out of my body and my psychedelic experience begins. First, I experienced complete ego death and was transported to what I can only describe as another dimension. Words truly cannot describe what I experienced during this portion of the trip. The biggest thing I remember was feeling like I was trapped there for literally an infinite amount of time. The experience was absolutely breathtaking, but also utterly terrifying and foreign. While this part of the trip was in itself a profound experience, what comes next is what has me questioning what reality is still to this day. As the trip progressed, 
I left this other dimension and found myself in more familiar surroundings. I could see that I was in my friend's car again and there were two cops at the windows. One was at the front of the truck shining a light at me and the other was at my passenger side window. The cop by my window was asking me something, but I was still trying to grasp reality and couldn't understand what he was saying. When I didn't answer You're his under question, arrest. <laughs> oh, <excuse laughs> yep. Are you under arrest? Step out of the vehicle. <laughs> yep. but when I didn't answer his question, wow. the whole scene repeated. Slowly after experiencing the scenario looping many, many times, I began to understand what he was asking me. His questions were, are you okay? And do you know where you are? Each time the scene repeated, I tried and failed to pull myself together and respond to his questions. Again, each time I failed, the scene would loop. This looping continued a countless number of times while I struggled to come back to reality. I found it nearly impossible to piece back together my mind and was on the verge of giving up when I started to notice some unusual things about the scene playing out. First, I realized that the truck was not outside but appeared to be in some clinically white room. I then noticed that the passenger seat and surrounding truck interior did not seem like the real thing but some type of simplified recreation of the original. Looking more closely at the cops, they also appeared very odd and looked almost like mannequins in cop uniforms with faces projected onto them. Whoa. After Whoa. noticing Ow. all of this... My thoughts were flooded with this overwhelming message that this was constructed to pull me out of my trip. And if I failed to properly complete the scene, I would never return to reality. Oh, no. This message terrified me and prevented me from completely giving in to despair and giving up. So I fought more to pull myself together. Little by little, over what seemed like an eternity in this looping scene, I slowly was able to get myself together. The instant I finally was able to successfully complete the scenario and answer the cop's questions, I snap out of my trip and was back in my body, and this is what I see. I'm in my friend's car, still in the passenger seat, and there are two cops. One at the front of the truck shining a light on me, and the second at my window. The cop at my window asked me, are you okay? And I manage a week, yeah, yeah, I'm okay, in response. He then asked me, do you know where you are? I managed a vague description of my current location. Earth? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> they get me out of the car, and there's ambulances and fire trucks everywhere. No a sign, I sign a release telling the paramedics they can leave, and my friend takes me back to my dorm. On the walk back, I ask my friend how long I was out. He said I had been unconscious for only 30 minutes. Then I asked him how many times the cop had tried to wake me up before I came to. He said the second they came up to my window, I snapped out of it like nothing happened. So there you have it, boys. I experienced future events almost an infinite amount of times before the actual moment occurred. What are y'all's thoughts on this? Have you ever Whoa. heard of anything similar? Thanks yeah. for taking the time to read through this rambling account. I hope you all enjoyed it. Keep up the great work, and maybe one day I'll go get myself regressed your friend con <laughs> it's like, thinks it's like an it. alien thing i guess <laughs> oh, yeah man I, I mean that sounds like simulation reality to me if anything right? supports that theory that but might I, be it there it is uh, well i love that Go ahead, Dylan. Go ahead, Dylan. Okay. No, yeah, Dylan, go I, for it. You go, go. Um, I, I actually think that, I mean, I can't speak of the alien thing, but I will say that, you know, I do think that by, and we talked about this, uh, Dale, on our podcast, when you mm. when you use uh, drugs or, or things like that, you kind of go into this, this state or mindset. And, like, there were a lot of uh, prophets and the oracles of Delphi, they use drugs to kind of get this um, – oracular prophecy but one thing that i do now i spoke to a client recently she went on an ayahuasca retreat um and she said that she had a similar trip where she was faced with these challenges and she kind of knew that she wouldn't be able to come out of the trip mm. unless she completed uh mm. said challenges uh and she said that they involved like walking through doors and it was very much like a maze um and if you think about that too look at alice in wonderland uh, which also 
is going into this other it's realm. It's also a drug yeah. induced story. Yeah. yeah. So I do think that there is, and I've heard it countless times, um, and there's actually a wonderful book uh, called um, uh, Walking on the Wild Side, and it's about uh, um, drug induced. Um, um, trips uh, and a lot of them involve these these challenges that are put on you and typically when you come out of it there is something that you've learned or you are about to face an upcoming obstacle that you had in that trip mm, that is wild yeah that sounds i mean exactly like what this guy was yeah it's a phenomenon yeah well i just wanted to share real quick an experience that i had that is very similar that I was given the wrong amount of weed and I told the person, cause I'm very sensitive. That's why I do CBD and stuff that I'm very sensitive. And I had took an edible and an hour went by and she, and I took the whole cube. You know how they come in cubes. Oh. I took the whole cube. You guys can understand. Like normally for me, I have to eat like a quarter, like the corner of it. No, I just popped the whole thing. Cause she told me it was CBD and I was standing in the bank <laughs> and I, <laughs> By the way, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I swear to God, I was, I was, it was with a friend. She was in the car, I was standing in the bank. And all of a sudden I looked around the bank and I said, wow, my sight is like clear. I'm going through some <laughs> really <laughs> major psychic transformation in this I, bank. And I was I, like, Dale is in 4k. I, no. <laughs> I was in 4k. I was looking at everybody in the bank and I was reading all of them like simultaneously. It was like kind of amazing. And then I realized, Oh no, no, this is, this is the weed. Oh my God. I have to walk up to the teller and he was smiling at me and I had to struggle to get words. Well now flash forward. I'm, I go to the car and said, I told her what's happening. I said, this is going to go bad. And all of a sudden I couldn't move. And I, as she was driving, I kept flashing back in time to her. She was wearing hoop earrings. There were people in the car with us that were like her friends and she was 20. And she kept saying when I was 20, when I was, tw I'm 20. And I was like, I knew she was 20 and she's talking to me and she's talking to me like, are you okay? But she's saying other things in this other place. And then I would flash back and I would say, what time zone are we? What time are we in? She goes, this, she would tell me the year. And I would say, okay, it's coming again. I would feel a wave and I would hit again. And I'd be in the car and her friends with her hoop earrings. And it kept happening. And I kept saying, what timeline are we in? And she would say the year. And I said, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm tr I was trying to pull myself back down. And I couldn't move. And she finally got food. And she had to feed it to me. And I literally felt myself going down and down till I was clicking into my body. Well, during this time, she tells me, Oh, by the way, I can't believe you're saying this age because my whole life changed at that age. It's a major age for me. And she's just telling me the story while I'm trying to come back. And I'm like, why are you telling me? That? I was like, what is happening? Like, she's telling me this is amazing. But I was still going back and forth and she was watching it until I clicked in to this time. Whoa. Man. Whoa. So I, I need us to say I was careful with weed after that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wish I had a similar experience. The last time I did an edible, I ended up uh, writing my own personal memoir on top of a limited edition of A Tale of Two Cities that my dad had given to me. So, oh, no. and he destroyed it. Yeah. Oh, no. You're like, this is but shit. I Let me write my story over here. Sounds I was right. born under the stars. This sounds right. More like it. Oh, no. Ah, uh, that's great. <laughs> and highlighter I think too. You could cross time. I think you could cross time though in things like that because I see that see time that way anyway. And I bet I just get a feeling he was seeing how time really works. It's just my feeling. Yeah, yeah. I think it's something along those lines too, of sort of breaking breaking through that dimensional barrier. Also, mm -hmm. that his account of ego death is like super duper common. Yeah, when people have mm -hmm. breakthrough psychedelic experiences, it's like. It's that first stage, and that's that where the fear hits you and everything. It's where people freak out, and then they don't go through into the other the other side of it. So yeah, that also, yeah. it's all very very textbook, deep mm -hmm. psychedelic experience. And yeah. even that idea of like suddenly you feel like you're on a set of a you know like the mannequins, and they do, you know it's something that's representing oh, yeah. the object. But that's come up before and stuff. This kind of reminded me of Terrence McKenna's stories of the machine elves when you mm. go into the other. You're kind of seeing behind the curtain. 
Um, mm-hmm. And it reminded me of John Tenney's uh, story that he had, mm-hmm. his near-death experience that he had, um, where he was just sort of in an egoless, infinite abyss that felt like forever, you know? So that yeah. was cause he, you know, I think died for two minutes or three yeah. minutes when he was a teenager. Yeah. Right. And there's no time there. So that makes right. sense. Well, it, it's also interesting too. Cause I feel like there's that common theme of, of knowing whether it be death or a trip or, or almost death or a trip, that sense of knowing that you have to come out of it, I guess, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So th- there is this, I mean, even when you look at movies, like, you have this idea of this spirit and they're talking to uh, an angel or something. And they're like, you have to come out of this, you know? And then the person kind of calling them back to life. Um, So it is interesting, this idea of like, you know, that, you know, or there's this moment where you know that you're in this parallel uh, that you have to come out of. Yeesh. Wild (laughs) stuff. Thanks for sharing. Con. Yeah. Well-written too. Great story. Yeah. Um, Riley, why don't you give us your next one? Already? All right. uh, No title. Gentlemen, guest, and beloved animals, I've been listening to BCC for almost a year now, and I would like to thank you all for what you do and the absolute delight this show has brought me, especially in times like these. That's nice. And then uh, they go on, enough cute shit, let's get spooky. (laughs) <laughs> I like it that already. Should be a shirt. <laughs> Seriously. All right. 2015, and I'm working second shift. I get home usually around 12 15 a.m. or so. However, I would stay up till two or three, sometimes later. I was living with my ex, who I also worked with, and we had one of our co workers over after work to hang out and smoke some weed. And then parentheses, I know, I know, but trust me, I've never smoked weed strong enough to have me see shit like this moving right along. That's really funny context of the conversation we just had. Um, it's know. almost it's as if thing. I la- laid this out in a narrative way. It's Don't show behind the curtain, Michael. <laughs> yeah, we like the magic. Yeah. I like it. No one gets in to see the wizard. All right. <laughs> at, around, at around 2.30ish, I decide to get ready for bed. I turn off the lights and lay down. For reference, my bed faces the door to my room, and the room is fairly dark except for some light that comes through the closed blinds of the window, as well as from around the door frame from the light in the hallway. While lying in bed, I'm looking at the door, and I see light from above the door frame slowly go from left to right. Not all at once, like the light was turned out, but as if there was a sheet or something being held on the other side of the door and brought slowly from the door hinges to the doorknob, eradicating the light from around the front flame. frame. I see the door open to complete pitch black darkness, and there's a figure of a man standing there. The figure is also completely black, and it's super weird I was able to see it, but here we are. I thought that maybe it was my ex fucking with me, playing a joke, so I say, I see you, what are you doing? No answer. I realize, in fact, that it's not my ex. I see the door close again. Once the door closes, the light returns around the door frame in the opposite way that it was extinguished, from doorknob to door hinges. Obviously, I was freaked out and needed a minute before I could get up and go back down out to the living room where, where my ex and our friend are still hanging out. I sit down and light a cigarette. We smoked inside. Don't worry. I quit and only smoke the good kush now. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> they we can tell me. <laughs> we were. They can tell I am freaked out and ask why. So I told them. Our coworker was way more freaked out than my ex, however. X was dumb as hell. So we, <laughs> we do we account his opinion in this? No. <laughs> Anyways. I love their writing. <laughs> awesome. Anyways, I've not had anything like that happen for a while, but I am a very spiritual person and have a solitary witchcraft practice. So I know I am open to paranormal experiences. There is also a ghost in my kitchen who lets me know when they are concerned I may burn the house down with the air fryer by lightly pulling on the back of my shirt, which is nice. That is convenient. I hope you enjoyed this story and would love to hear your thoughts on it if y'all get around to a Listener Files episode. Kisses, Sarah. Nice. I want a safety ghost. <laughs> Serious safety ghost is a really... That's a, that's a good business, you know? I, Put all yeah, these I have those. I have those. They're good. I, I think I have those. I do get the opening doors bit. I used to text... Remember a deal I would text you in the middle of the night? It, I'd be like, my closet just opened by itself. Um, yeah, that was after um, we did a seance with me or something, and you <laughs> yeah. said you were open to it. 
and then you didn't want to see him. <laughs> then I was, yeah, then I was done. And then you're done. But the think, she so that sounds like ghost. a shadow person that she's seeing, and um, shadow people are really just your own sight. Obviously, she's got some sight going on because she's okay with her safety ghost letting her know, and she's also listening, which most people don't. Um, so she's having like someone who's helping her and it could believe it or not be the same thing. That's what she may not realize because her sight, the shadow is just really the shadow of your own, uh, third eye, your own sight, right. Trying to like see. So just kind of imagine you're trying to break through and see it, but you're not seeing it. The reason why I know is cause I've seen them and then I can see who they are. So right, you're saying for, sight uh, as in like, it's not an optical illusion. It's something like your psychic vision you're seeing. Yeah. Your psychic vision. It's kind of like, kind of imagine it's not tweaked all the way to see it. So, you know, I've done that for other people. I've been in there a room that people see that and then I can see it. I can just, you know, tune in and see what it is to them. It looks shadowy because they're just not fully developed it. So my advice to her is like, obviously you're doing this stuff. You're, listening to the spirit that's helping you, which I have that do that all the time. And that's awesome. It can, that's the point they can do that. But if you wanted to see a little bit more, you can work on your, um, you don't have to see them in front of you. If you don't want, it could be just your mind's eye being able to pull back the curtain. Basically when you said, you know, behind the curtain, it's the same thing. Right. Yeah. And I and I think to her, you know, her connection to witchcraft, that will help her too to ground her um and protect her on, on other levels. Um and and she doesn't have to pay a fee for her service ghost. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I love how you just flip the kitchen ghost just at the very end. Just, just mention right. it as a throwaway. Yeah. <laughs> She's obviously that. comfortable with it. That's what I'm saying. That's what I, when some people tell me that stuff, I'm like, well, you're obviously, this is something you're doing, but you're just not going all the way in the deep end yet. Mm. Michael, I'm just kidding. Don't look at me. Don't look at me with that <laughs> psychic guy. I know you're staring Bryce. at me. <laughs> Bryce. <laughs> Uh-oh. All right. Bryce, we know why, don't you, why don't you take us down the path of our next listener file? Let's do it. Hi. My experience happened in South Africa in a town called Harrismith about 14 years ago. I was 20 years old. A friend and I went on our very first road trip. It was a seven hour drive and so we planned a halfway stop to stay over and continue our trip the next day. The B&B we stayed over at, I googled it up again, is described as an Edwardian style house built in 1912. It was old creaky and creepy with wooden floors, thick walls, and old furniture. Anyway, that night, we wanted to get a good night's rest for the next day's drive to our end destination. I almost just fell asleep when my friend said, something just touched me. I did not believe her and felt angry that she was joking around. She was joking around all afternoon about how scary the place was. I turned on the bedroom light and she then pulled out two bobby pins from her bed covers. She said something put it there and that it wasn't there before. I was annoyed and told her to stop messing around. I turned off the light and went back to bed. Within a few minutes, there were footsteps entering our room. I laid still and just listened. Suddenly, what sounded like a bunch of keys to me dropped to the wooden floor with a big bang. My friend called out my name super scared and I was also super scared. I whispered back, shh, just shh, hoping and waiting for it to go away. Then something or someone hit my pillow really hard. Whoa. I could feel the air, the wind moved past my face and my pillow made a loud poof sound. I jumped up <laughs> and immediately turned on the light again. I shouted, leave us alone. My friend was in her bed. There was nothing on the floor, nothing near or on my pillow. We kept the lights on and TV on for the rest of the night. We didn't get much sleep that night. Next morning at breakfast, the owner told us that someone else once saw a woman walk into the room dropping a jewelry box. She also said that she sometimes sees wow. shadows in the house and around the garden. She also mentioned that the military used the house in the Ango Boer War. I never believed in ghosts. 
and never experienced anything like that before or after that night again. I think the fact that my friend was open to these sorts of things might have attracted it to us that night. I still wonder, who or what slapped my pillow? Was it the same woman who dropped the jewelry box, or was there another ghost in the room? Thanks for letting me share. I enjoy listening to everyone's stories and your podcast. I'm not kidding. I suddenly feel like there is someone standing over my shoulder. And I'm so freaked out right now. All right. Oh, Michael, you, you open. I told you, like, see, just got to open and look. I don't want to turn around. Well, then just tell I'm it right to stop. There with you. And just stop. tell it to stop. Please just stop tell going. It to stop. I don't want you you gotta to go be away. like, you have to be firm about it, though. You can't, like, in your mind's eye. Not, you don't even have to say yeah. it out loud. Michael, just be like, my ghost hours are 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. Okay? That's what I do. We're closed Thank you, right Bryce. now. Yeah, That's my, exactly my, my what ghost, I do. My ghost hours, I love that. Um, I will say, just, though, I, when done. I stayed in Jersey, um, I, st- I was staying with friends, and I was in the upstairs uh, bedroom. And in the middle of the night, and I don't know if I've told this story before, but, like, the comforter was, like, it was like a bubble and was, like, floating above me. Like, there was just, like, space between me and the comforter. Um, And in that same Mm. house, uh, I was commuting to New York for school for musical theater. And I could not find my tap shoes for the life of me. No one was in the house. I went upstairs, downstairs. And when I came upstairs for the third time when I was about to miss the bus, those shoes were at the foot of my bed. And there's no way I would have not seen those. So I definitely believe that, you know, spirits can assist or help in some way. Is it gone, Michael? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you're I don't good. Know. The, the feeling's gone. I don't know. We'll see. Well, th- that's, that's just the frequency, like the volume going down. So you're All good. All right. I don't know what you did, Adela, but. Listen, thanks. you guys ask for this stuff and then you get all upset when the stuff starts happening. I can't, I can't, you get confusing me. Michael, you can, I, uh, Michael, you, you can knit, knit yourself one of those hats where there's eyeballs in the back. You know how hikers <laughs> use to keep, to keep mountain lions love, from pouncing them from the idea. back? Oh my God, I love that. I love uh, how Bryce says this, but he doesn't like it either. I'm so like let's, a, call, yeah. let's call it on over yeah. to Bryce's side of the yeah. track. It's like one of those <laughs> caterpillars that make it look like they have a head where their butt is. So yeah, that's exactly. Adela gets annoyed um, because yeah. I'll, okay. I'll do these workings and I'll be like, I want to talk to spirits. And then I'll text her the next day and be like, Adela, I had an experience. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, I feel like the the what, what she experiences that that's a, that's again an aggressive spirit that um, they will do that when I've gotten poked many times. Um, like the boundaries, I can't stress more enough the boundaries that you can create. Bryce is actually not wrong. Um, I actually set kind of hours and times, so to speak. Um, I'm not good at it during sleep. And there, you know, it's the hardest time because you're the most, um, your mind's going to sleep and your spirit's more ready to play. But, um, but that, those, that type of like hitting the pillow and, um, dropping something, um, and recreating that sound, you, it's just like, frequencies and, and like sound, you know, like how air can, you can use air and you can use electrical currents to make. And those are definitely ones that are basically, if there was someone in the room with her, who's what I call the Wi-Fi is up a little higher than others, then yeah, they're like, you can see me. So they're not polite about it. I have to make people realize spirit world isn't polite like higher beings. There are people who died it's, and they progress and they grow, but your personal family members don't want to do this to you. But those who don't know you may kind of be frustrated that nobody's really, really kind of paying attention. And if they're bad boys and girls, they do this. But if your Wi-Fi is a little high and they can see that frequency, they and they they don't care about being aggressive, then then they'll be aggressive with you, like so, meaning like pushy. Is this a do, you, do? Is this a ghost? It's like permanently haunting this house or is this just like uh a random ghost passing through the 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 listener was asking is this a uh is this the same woman with the jewelry box or is this somebody else like uh what what what's your guys take on that 
I'm sure it's the same woman probably because it's the elements that she's doing with like, you know, dropping and making the sound. And when I've done cleansings and there's, uh, and I have to talk to the spirit and they're like upset because me, like I did one where the man died in the house and it was kind of like his family treated him poorly. He wasn't meaning to really create like their electrical stuff to break and all this stuff that was happening. He was just like, how come nobody really acknowledged I died here and I didn't die so well and once i did that with him and acknowledged it and explained to him like you just can't do that anymore it's just like policing he um and going like there's you know rules to to how much you're doing he was okay with it he he stopped so she could be like hey i just want someone to kind of it's not like she's haunting she's in both worlds it's just like i had a spirit in a reading give me a really good example that i'm using now that said kind of imagine like there's an ocean right on our earth on our earth and there's a whole nother world in the ocean in that spirit world is but it's on earth but it's a whole nother world that's how the spirit world is it's here but it's just a whole nother way of being and it's just a whole nother world so yeah she just she's definitely just making herself known for some reason i would have to like talk to her to figure out what the hell her problem is to know (laughs) why (laughs) I like that. The ocean, uh, another world. Yeah, right? The ocean of ghosts. The ocean (laughs) ocean of ghosts. ghosts. (laughs) All right. Here's one. Here's our last one for uh, for the episode. Here we go. This is called Denver Haunted Park. Hey, Bigfoot boys. I was binging through old Patreon eps and noticed in the Dog Woman episode, Bryce said he didn't know any spooky legends from Denver. I also grew up in Denver and loved reading about local legends and wanted to share my favorite. The story of Cheeseman Park begins in 1858. The area where it would would come to lie was nothing but wide open plains bordered by the rip-roaring gold mining town of what would be soon called Denver. The burgeoning settlement had everything a red-blooded American man could ask for. Saloons, <laughs> whorehouses, stolen Native American land, and of course... <laughs> Wait. Wait. I'm obsessed. Wait. Okay. A cemetery. <laughs> now, Sorry. while the first man buried in Mount Prospect was an upright citizen, the second man to be buried was a gold-thieving murderer. After being publicly hanged in front of a crowd of more than 1,000 spectators, he was tossed in a grave with his victim. The outermost edge of the cemetery became a burial bonanza for paupers, vagrants, ne'er-do-wells, and criminals. Not wanting to be buried with the riffraff, the wealthy, upstanding white citizens of the town chose to be buried elsewhere, and the cemetery was left to the poor and minority population. By the 1870s, Old Boneyard, as it was known to the locals, fell mostly into disrepair. By the 1880s, it was bordered by the homes of elite Denver citizens who wanted the eyesore gone. On January 25th, 1890, Denver received authorization to vacate the graveyard so it could be turned into a park. Relatives had just 90 days to collect the bodies of their loved ones. And after this period of time, most of the bodies still laid unclaimed. A contractor by the name of E.P. McGovern was hired to move the remaining dead to Riverside Cemetery. For the first couple of days, McGovern moved the remains into new coffins in an, in an orderly and ethical manner. He quickly realized, though, that he could increase his profit by using child coffins and breaking up the bodies. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh God. man. I'm making this... an extra two dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> the deceased were unceremoniously chopped to bits and shoved into three foot by one foot boxes. Jeez. Ghoulish grave robbers also picked through the gruesome scene to steal any valuable trinkets. The newspaper at the time reported the line of desecrated graves at the southern boundary of the cemetery sickened and horrified everybody by the appearance they presented. Around their edges were piled broken coffins, rent and tattered shrouds of fragments of clothing that had been torn from the dead bodies. All were trampled into the ground by the footsteps of the gravediggers like rejected junk. McGovern resigned from the position in hopefully shame. (laughs) No new contract was awarded to move the rest of the dead. Construction on the park began a year later. The remaining bodies and parts of bodies were covered 
Trees were planted, roads were laid, houses were built, and the former cemetery became Cheeseman Park and the Denver Botanical Gardens. Bones are still regularly found in the area, especially oh after heavy rain and during renovations. This is fucking wild. <laughs> many houses many houses in the area have reports of strange activity. The movie The Changeling was based on Russell Hunter's experience while living in the Henry Treat Rogers Mansion. No way. Which was local uh, which was located directly across from the park. People are said to have seen spirits and shadows wandering aimlessly through the lawns at night, although it is also a popular spot for cruising, so some of the shadows might just be horny dudes. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. A popular and hilarious rumor among school-aged children in the area is that the more aggressive squirrels are, in fact, possessed by spirits. (laughs) Okay. Anyway, I'm not great at writing conclusions, but that's what I've got. Some sources and more info, ghost stories about the park, are at this link, and I will put that in the show notes. Thanks for reading. Hope it wasn't too long. I have a history degree, passion for folklore, and a lot of time on my hands. Stay safe, Lyric. Uh, thank oh, you, Lyric. Um, amazing. What a great. I want to start, a, great, a, start a, a, a cemetery tour company called the Horny the Horny Shadow right. Boys Club. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll That's I'll brutal. But I will add to that. So I heard, I heard uh, about that story and in that park. And the thing about that too is that in Denver, uh, one of the Native American tribes is the Cheyenne, um, and they were very big on on uh, their uh, burial grounds, uh, and they would do rituals to kind of protect and consecrate that land. Uh, and unlike other um, Native American tribes, they actually weren't as passive uh when it came to uh when the uh colonists and stuff kind of infiltrated uh the other thing too is that there is a term for uh when they were talking about um the uh to uh burying uh, people in chopping up the bodies and the term for it is charging them for the big and burying them in the small Oh. Uh, and <laughs> and it was something that was very popular during the uh, 1800s and 1900s. Um, and if there was anyone who did not do a, uh, they would actually push to not do an open casket. Uh, and what they would do is you would pay for this larger coffin or an adult sized coffin, and then they would chop you up and they would bury you in a smaller, uh, smaller coffin. God. Yeah. You know, it brings me to a great question. Wow. The one that I the one that I've sort of wondered, is there is there a better way to go about once you die? Is there is there is there I mean, for a peaceful passing and transition, is it best to be buried or cremated or left alone for 3 days like the the Rosicrucianism uh wanted their bodies? Uh, is there is there like a certain way to uh what's the best way to go about, you know, handling death after you're gone? Well, I found that like when I talk to spirits, they pretty much always, 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 I have to say every single time say it's not once they give me different stories, but once they've popped out of the body, it's not really what people think. There's different ways I've did, I did a few today where they um, may have different experiences about how they see it. Every It's just like everyone's unique perspective of how things happen, mm. but pretty much they like the, you know, they may be standing there and looking at their body. Some of them say a door kind of like open. Some of them say, I didn't really see light, but I saw a lot of colors and I kind of got swirled up in the energy. They all kind of have a different story to tell, but their way of doing it, but they always, always say like that, that is for you guys. And once I'm out, I'm out, but mm. whatever you guys need to do, I know Dylan's going to say a uh, different thing. And there's probably, he's probably better at like a ritual explanation and at uh, people need and, and the history. But I'm just saying that, um, they always kind of are very more concerned what's good for the people here that right. uh, all the time. Yeah. I'm always actually, Dale, I, oh, I, uh, go ahead. Dylan. Uh, oh no, I was just going to say, actually, Dale, I agree with you because I think rituals, oh. death rituals mm-hmm. are for the living. It's, mm-hmm. it's for the living. It's, it's what appeases the living. The only civilization that I would say where I do think actually the two civilizations that I would say Egypt. that yeah. is yes, Ancient <laughs> Egypt and I think the Native Americans. Those mm. were two civilizations that put a lot of input on on 
or put a lot of uh, energy in regards to uh, their ancestors and, and taking care of their dead. So aside from that, I feel like, you know, it is for the living, but the Egyptians really did cater to uh, their dead. Interesting. I only mm-hmm. I only ask because my wife decided for me. So she's like, I've got oh. you oh. I've got you I've got you signed up for cremation. So I'm like, well, what? Wow, wow. <laughs> wow, this got dark really quick. <laughs> well, you, know, no, you know, you got gotta handle your due diligence. I guess that's true. Now, well, are you, I are you gonna it, be in a jar or are you gonna be scattered? Oh, I have no jar. idea. I, I I'm with you guys. Once I'm gone, who what's it matter anyway? Uh hey, but, Bryce, uh, yeah. Bryce, little advice. Yeah. Might start to uh, prepare your own food while I'm locked down. <laughs> <laughs> Cook your own food, buddy. Cook your own food. Uh, <laughs> but I will now, say is this. Is she going to be cremated too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's okay, cool, she's down cool. for that. She's she's into that. You know, she doesn't want to be buried with, with bugs and all that stuff. So I get that. I'm like, right. I'm, I'm there. I'm yeah. there with you. Bugs well, are gross. <laughs> thus... We end another L Files episode. Uh, On a this high one, note. we'll burn this one as soon as it's over. Uh, <laughs> Mystic Dylan, Adela Levine, uh, where can people find The Witch in the Medium? And where can people find you on social media? Uh, you can find The Witch in the Medium on Instagram at The Witch in the Medium. Uh, and you can check out our podcast wherever podcasts are distributed and you can find me at uh, mystic dylan official on instagram and my website mystic and yes uh yes you can find us um also our witch in the medium instagram if you want to follow um and um i'm adela levine on all platforms um and my website is adelalevine.com both of us we should announce are giving 50 percent off of our readings during this time I know my code's peace, and Dylan is very creative on his code. Tell him, Dylan. Tell him what your code. Yes. (laughs) Right to the point. Very, very creative. We're trying trying to help people during um, with what they need at this time. So there you go. Fantastic. Uh, Bryce, Riley, where can people find you? Find us on our Instagram at Bigfoot Collectors Club uh, on all social media accounts. Email us your high strangeness stories. We would love to tell your story next on our listener files. And you can do that at Bigfoot Collectors Club at gmail.com. Uh, find us on our Instagrams. I think you're at McMills. Uh, Riley's at Peace Drone. I'm at Mr. Bryce Johnson, um, where we deliver a lot of our more personal content, but it relates to the show. And uh, that's about it. And speaking of relating to our show, please relate our show to your relations, your friends, your family, and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts so we can get the show to more people. If you leave us a five-star review, we might read it right here on the air, like this one from Horrorhead333, who says, Bigfoot Collectors Club is simply the best the best uh love these guys and love the podcast they're really amazing and go out of their way to make this the best podcast out there you can feel their passion for the subjects they talk about thank you uh please do that uh support the show uh until next time i remain michael mcmillan for bryce johnson and riley bray good night and go get regressed there you go Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock multiple reward episodes every month.